Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Um, we are here with another installment of Office Hours with Lisa Wang, um, which is part of the Women Made Initiative by PepsiCo to help female entrepreneurs get supported with everything they need to grow and scale their companies. Um, and here I am uh, Sandra Crawford with Alice, um, and we are co-hosting this event as well as um, providing resources for everyone in the Women Made community on HelloAlice.com. Today, Lisa is joined by Jerry Kirilova from Laconia Capital Group, and we are going to be talking all about um, types of investors and deal terms. So, Lisa, would you care to take us away? Sure. Thank you. And welcome to today's live female founder office hours. My name is Lisa Wang. I am the founder of SheWorks, and I'm so excited to have everyone here. Um, as mentioned, I'm here today with Jerry Kirilova. She's an investor at Laconia Capital Group, and they're focused on B2B seed stage companies. And we will be talking about different types of investments, um, the different deal terms, the pitch process, and especially if you're new to fundraising, understanding what you can and should negotiate can often feel really confusing. So we are going to do our best to try and share insights and help you answer those questions today. And um, before we get started, I want to say a quick thank you to PepsiCo and Alice for making these office hours possible. Uh, this is going to be a really engaging and informative hour. And as you do hear interesting quotes or valuable nuggets of information, uh, I highly encourage you to write them down, tweet them out, uh, tag PepsiCo. I'm at Lisa Wang Wins and Hello Alice. And the, the way this is going to be structured is the first half we'll be talking, um, we'll be getting insights from Jerry. And then as you hear interesting things and you have questions, just share them in the chat box and the Q&A section. And just for a, a quick uh, understanding where everyone's from, if you could type in the chat box, I would love to hear, um, just type in your name, what city you're from, so we can see where you guys are all tuning in from. So go ahead and do that. Cool, we've got Tiana from Oakland, California, Amaya from Washington, DC, Kirti from SF, Nicola from Dubai, awesome. We've got an international audience, and it's always great to see so many people internationally tuning into these. Sophia from Vancouver, Natalia from New York, Jane from Scotland, Carly from San Francisco, Rosanna from South Carolina, Stephanie from New York, Joanna from Emeryville, Anna from San Francisco, awesome. Um, so we've got some really good representation here geographically. And um, so we are going to get started with Jerry. And without further ado, um, I just want to quickly introduce Jerry. Jerry um, is responsible for leading and supporting investments and facilitating Laconia's operations and fundraising. And prior to joining Laconia, Jerry was an associate at the Techstars IoT Accelerator, and she helped startups um, on customer acquisition, growth strategy, fundraising, BD, messaging, and storytelling. And in addition, she's worked in venture capital in Central and Eastern Europe, um, in Bulgaria and Prague, Czech Republic. So she's got a lot of experience doing this, uh, both in the US as well as internationally. And Jerry, welcome to Office Hours. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Cool. So to get started, I would love for you to just share your um, and Laconia's general investment thesis and what makes you excited about the companies that you do end up investing in. Definitely. So as you mentioned earlier, we're focused on early stage B2B software companies with a geographic focus on companies headquartered in Northeast U.S. major markets. So we tend to focus mostly on New York, Boston, Philly, and D.C. Part of the rationale for this investment strategy is that we are extremely hands-on investors with our portfolio of seed stage companies. Laconia was started by two former operators and entrepreneurs, Jeffrey Silverman and David Arakara, and they really started a fund that uh, would enable them to work closely in the area where they add the most value, which is seed stage companies that are working on sales acceleration, operations, and capital strategy, and that seed to series A stage. So a lot of what we do is um, meeting with our companies for working sessions as early as the diligence process, um, helping them set up their sales infrastructure in terms of teams, compensation, um, early hires, uh, key sort of VP or head of sales candidates, um, and then really supporting them with uh, fine tuning their sales and marketing strategy, everything from top of the funnel to managing that process, um, and really helping them get into some of the key enterprise 
uh, or SMB clients that they're targeting. So that geographic proximity tends to be key to us building those relationships with founders and really supporting them in a hands-on way. Um, I was the first person they brought on shortly after they started the fund. So it's the three of us on the investment team. We're now a full team of six people, including a head of community, and then two people who are focused um, partially on our advisory service, which is a separate part of the business. Um, and we're really excited about uh, working with companies very closely. We have a concentrated portfolio strategy where we'll only end up having probably about 12 or 13 companies in our second fund. Um, and we typically lead or co-lead our rounds alongside other investors with checks of 500K to a million dollars. Awesome. And when it comes to the founders that you do end up investing in, what really stands out about them? A lot of the times, um, it tends to be founders who are really focused on a problem that they know super well um, and who have a really deep understanding of the details of their business. So obviously everyone says, you know, people first, founders first, they're the most important thing. But for us, you know, there's sort of a degree of detail in the way they articulate their business that stands out to us. So founders who kind of know their numbers inside out, um, who understand the levers that drive the business, and who can really tell a strong vision story. Um, anytime we walk out of a meeting and we're like, did you get what they do? Not really. Well, I didn't really get that part. That's usually a sign that they haven't been able to really tell it in a way that's easy to understand. The other thing that we personally are biased towards, um, especially given our B2B software focus, is founders that have uh, sort of key sales ability within the founding team. So we typically don't tend to invest in, you know, deep tech, frontier tech companies uh, that are more focused on the technical development rather than the commercialization. So this is definitely a bit of sort of an East Coast VC bias. Um, we really like founding teams that are able to understand their buyer's needs um, and have built something that, you know, there's an initial proof of concept in the market that they're selling into that this is really, really needed. So I would say those are kind of the two top things. It's that attention to detail about the mechanics of their business um, and this, this sort of unique sales ability from the early days. Got it. Um, and so could you give an example um, of a strong financial story? Like let's say there's a founder who's coming in um, and they're, they're, you know, they, they have some revenue, but they, mm -hmm. they're not at that super high growth phase yet what would they have to say or, you know, what, what are the specific milestones that you'd want them to touch on? Definitely. So this will vary sort of from firm to firm, depending on investment focus for us, because we're focused on this seed stage. Um, we do typically look for some revenue. Um, often the companies we see have been fairly capital constrained to date. So to your point, there often isn't this sort of 3x, 4x, 5x growth trajectory because they haven't had the bandwidth to really allocate toward anything like that. But what we like to see is, first of all, some evidence of the market demand. Often that is early revenues, but sometimes it's pilots, sometimes it's, um, you know, a long, you know, pipeline. It depends. But, but that initial traction of like, here are the data points that we have that show that there's demand for this in the, in the market. That's sort of the first checkbox. Then the other way you can tell that story is with things like um, your actual pipeline, right? So you can tell a story that says, hey, we've gotten to 15K in monthly recurring revenue so far. We expect that we're going to get to 100K monthly recurring revenue by the end of the year based on this pipeline that we have, where we're in conversations with 100 companies and we expect that we're going to close this many into demos and this many into conversions or whatever it is. So the more you can sort of demonstrate that, first of all, you have that pipeline lined up, the better. And then the second thing is um, that you understand what those different stages and mechanics are. So you understand what causes growth to happen if that makes sense. So, you know, what we don't like to see to provide a counter example is, yeah, we're projecting that we're going to grow 10% month over month. Like that's not a great financial story for us because that growth trajectory is actually an output of your business. It's not something you can control, right? You grow a certain rate because of certain levers that you push and pull on. So that's the story that we like to see. If we do X, Y, Z based on this data that we have, we know that we will grow in this way. Got it. And what are different ways that someone could show that data? Um, you know, like, I think a common thing is people talk about marketing or like spending ad dollars. What do you think about that sort of conversation? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so it depends on what the sort of, you know, true mechanics of the sales process are. There are some businesses that tend to be more inbound driven, where it is a function of, you know, ad spend and ad dollars. What we would want to see there is at least some data on how that has been tested and what kind of conversions you're seeing. Um, that's always kind of a tricky story to tell because it raises the question of defensibility in the long term, right? So what happens, you know, if this is sort of a, you know, a, a brand of some sort, whether it's consumer facing or a B2B product, what happens when the space heats up and now everyone starts applying this strategy? Like, do those numbers get really out of whack? Um, but yeah, first of all, it's having sort of like any preliminary data on how that is working. And then the other more typical channel that we tend to see in the B2B space is uh, more traditionally sort of like inside sales driven businesses where you have sort of a sales infrastructure within the organization of SDRs, BDRs, account executives, et cetera, who are really driving the sales actively. And then in that scenario, again, you're looking at all the data on the different stages of conversion of your sales funnel, which is if we, we know that if we send you know, 10,000 cold emails, we're gonna get you know, this many people to click on them and this many people to then schedule a call and all the different conversion stages throughout that funnel. So like, yeah, you either show the data behind what's happening on your marketing and ad spend in terms of the efficiencies there, or you're showing the, the, the early data on what's happening in sort of the stages of your sales funnel. Got it. Okay. Um, and so given that you guys are later stage um, seed, do a lot of the companies come to you having already raised a bit of angel or a bit of friends and family? Yeah, the vast majority of them have raised anywhere from a couple hundred grand to a couple of million, and it's usually friends, family, angel money. Every now and then there's sort of an institutional pre-seed fund that has written a check, but it's usually friends, family, angels. Okay, and when it comes to then, you know, one of the things we're discussing is the types of investors. So angel investors versus a VC fund like Laconia, what's the difference in terms of what angels are looking for? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. So angel investors and VCs can have fundamentally different motivations. So for those of you who are less familiar with the landscape, angel investors are individual people who write checks with their personal capital. They do this for a variety of reasons. Some of them do it um, as sort of a second career. They do it out of curiosity. They do it as a learning opportunity. They do it to contribute to causes that are personally important to them, whatever they might be. And then there are others who are sort of what, what I would call professional angel investors who are trying to generate returns repeatedly from their angel portfolio. I would say that in my experience in the East Coast and in New York City, those are a fairly rare breed. Um, if you are from the West Coast, you'll probably have a higher concentration of those. But over here, it tends to be a lot of people who, for the most part, are doing this um, just out of their personal interests and personal happiness, right? So the key difference there is that they have pretty much all the decision-making power. Maybe they have some family constraints around, you know, how they make a decision on what they put their capital towards or not. For the most part, it's just them. VCs, venture capital firms, are institutional investors. Their capital comes from somewhere. In most cases, for traditional venture capital firms, it comes from a series of limited partners who have invested into this fund, and the VCs are responsible. They have a fiduciary responsibility to those investors to generate returns for them and to execute on their investment thesis. So it can be frustrating for founders when they say, why won't VCs invest in, in XYZ? Well, very often they have uh, an investment mandate that they legally have to follow or their investors could do them. Right, so that's sort of the, the short story of it. So you have this difference in motivation, right? The angel investors are doing this of their own accord for their own interest. The venture capital firms are fiduciaries of other people's capital. So that's where you get sort of a fundamental difference. Now, what are the implications of that? The implications for an early stage founder are that if you're pitching from a venture to a venture capital firm, typically there are going to be more boxes to check. There's going to be a higher bar for due diligence. Um, there's going to be more limitations and rules, and there are going to be sort of different expectations for what happens when you raise money from VCs. Because again, these investors are managing capital and they answer to other investors. Um, they might put you through more diligence and they have different expectations for the growth trajectory. An angel investor for the most part could invest in a company and be perfectly happy with um, a more moderate growth trajectory. For VCs, that's trickier because in order for them to hit their own fund goals, um, you know, this essentially puts founders on a certain track. 
So you'll hear about the hockey stick growth and all of these expectations that, you know, sometimes seem fairly unreasonable. But the reality is that a VC firm managing a pool of investments just has to abide by certain expectations. So those are the differences, right? And depending on the kind of company you're building, you want to make sure that your investment partners are aligned with your interests. Um, there, there's a fit for VC for certain companies and there's a fit for angel investors. Sometimes they overlap, sometimes they don't. But it's just important to have everyone's sort of interests in mind when you're creating that partnership because you want to find out sooner rather than later uh, what everyone is hoping for with the deal. Great. That was a really great overview. When it comes to finding angel investors, so I get this question all the time. Where do I find angel yeah. investors? Um, what would you say? Yeah, so it depends where you are, first of all. Um, one thing I want to put out there is uh, what are the accreditation requirements for angel investors? Typically for private individuals, I think it's something like you need to be making in the U.S. at least 200 grand a year for two years straight, or you need to have a net worth of a million dollars. I think for couples, if you're married, it's something like a 300K threshold. Um, but that's sort of the bar, which depending on where you are in the world and in the U.S., and depending on what your professional network is, it may or may not be a particularly high bar, right? So if you're in San Francisco and you know a bunch of engineers, chances are most of them actually could angel invest in your company. Like that's the reality. The flip side of that is for most people everywhere, it's a pretty high bar. And if you don't happen to have a lot of rich friends and family, it's challenging. Um, so typically I kind of put this into like two or three different categories. One is the like literal friends and family category into which I'll include former or current uh, bosses, coworkers, professional contacts, etc. This is a bucket of people who are investing in you and only you alone because they love you and they trust you. So it's entirely personal capital based. They trust you. Um, that's sort of like the first line of defense. The reality is that, you know, a lot of people who want to start businesses just don't have that. Um, and they don't know anyone who will be able to, even if they wanted to write them a check of any sort. That's when you start thinking about the other ways um, to sort of get connected with people who can do this. And it really becomes, um, you know, a networking and relationship building game. And these aren't mutually exclusive. Maybe you have both of these. But what I typically advise founders in that situation is, you want to think about who is sort of strategically aligned or personally aligned with the company you're building. So this could be either, you know, if it's something social impact related, you look for people who are passionate about the cause, or if it's just very specific to an industry, right? Let's say you are building something for the music industry and it's a, you know, a platform for a distribution of royalties, right? Just a random example you're going to want to start getting in touch with people who are experts in the space who can not only provide uh, sort of strategic help and insight, um, but could also potentially be the people who get really excited about this, understand what you're working on and gain conviction to write you a check. So I would think about it that way. I would sort of make like a wish list of people who, if you could hire them or have them be involved in your company or be on your advisory board, who are they and start finding pathways to them. Because at a certain point in time, I think for most industries, you'll end up running into people who have been successful in their own right, who are open to making investments, and those could be your early angel investors. In a sort of tangential category to that, um, something else that you know, we're starting to see more and more of, and this is probably happening for ages, is you have a lot of people who are from the tech ecosystem, including but not only founders and CEOs who have had fairly successful tracks of their own, they are now starting to reinvest in the, the ecosystem. So let's say you're in an industry where, for whatever reason, you're either not having a lot of success with people who don't want to, um, you know, write checks into startups or can't, um, you can sort of build that affinity around the entrepreneurial path and start looking for other entrepreneurs who get it, who understand the journey you're on, who might be interested in angel investing as well. But all of these things are sort of centered around different ecosystems. So if you don't have it in your personal life, then you have to find some sort of affinity group in your professional life to sort of draw people into it. Those are sort of the categories. Um, but the challenge is, you know, it's, it's not super scalable. There are a handful, um, and actually there's more and more of them now popping up all the time, but there are sort of like all these different angel groups like New York Angels, HBS Angels, Pipeline Angels, um, 37 Angels, all these angel groups where they're focused on um, that sort of really early stage capital. But, 
you know, that's also, I would keep in mind that for a lot of those, it's still a pretty lengthy due diligence process. Um, and a lot of them are looking for traction that is similar to what venture firms are looking for these days. So at the end of the day, at the very, very early stages, it's still going to be mostly one-on-one -on -one individual based. Yeah, I think that that was a, that was a really great overview um, in terms of how to find those early investors, because I think too often founders come from this position of, well, I just don't have rich friends and family. Totally. Like, and, totally. and that, the, the, the reality is that's true of many, if not most people. And the thing is, as an entrepreneur, you know, the, the, the very nature of being an entrepreneur is you're creating something from nothing. Absolutely. And, and so what that, that kind of goes to one of my core values of full responsibility is that you take full responsibility for whatever appears in your life and whatever stage you're at in life. And so same thing with, you know, if you don't do anything with your company, it's not going to build itself. If you don't go out there and network and go pitch and find events and strategically, like you said, figure out your wish list of who it is that you want to target, they're yeah. not going to just come to you. Absolutely. They're not going to come to you. And I think um, it's always kind of tricky to bridge that gap. And I've sort of felt this personally with my life as well, where it took me a long time to figure out that just because you aren't from a certain network or you weren't born into one or you didn't grow up around one, doesn't mean that you can't still create it in large part. Um, and I think there are so many institutional challenges with the funding landscape that if you get me started, we can go on for days. <laughs> but the reality is that it's not fully deterministic and there's still a lot of opportunity. You just have to create some of it for yourself. Yeah, yeah. And it, I think of it, the idea of being a heroine, not a victim. It, it, it yeah. is very easy to feel victimized yeah. and like always focusing on the statistic that only 2% of funding goes to women or 94% of yep. investors are men. But the reality is there are women who do get funded and the ones who do are the ones who are going out um, and not putting themselves in that position as a victim. And definitely. Um, yeah, so I, I definitely think that there's opportunity. I think myself, I, I didn't come from any of that. And I, I literally created a business based off of networking, and connecting people to the investors mm -hmm. that I couldn't get access to previously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, there's definitely an increasingly large sub-segment of investors who are working on making all of this better, but the reality is, while we're fighting to open up access and make things, you know, more transparent, it's going to take a long time, and you just have to find the alternative pathways and, and the pockets where you can still keep moving in the meantime. It's, it's not going to be one or the other. Definitely. So what is the process of pitching these different types of investors? Let's say you do get that introduction. What's next? What can you expect? Yes. Uh, so is the question about angels or VCs or both? Let's, let's start with angels and then go into VCs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for angels, it can vary wildly just because it depends on the person. Um, I think one thing to always remember is your initial meeting with an angel investor or with any investor really is a, a person to person conversation. The most awkward thing we run into is when you sort of sit down with someone and then you get like the demo day pitch. You sit down and you're like, hey, how are you? And they go, hey, did you know that the trucking industry is $12 billion? <laughs> and you're like, hang on, hang on, person, <laughs> conversation. So think of it that way. And um, you'll hear one of our partners say this a lot. Think of it as a first date. So you also don't want to dive into like the nitty gritty and all the detail uh, right out of the gate. You want to think of this as like, this meeting is here for you to establish some rapport, intrigue them, get them interested in learning more, and determine if there's a fit for you to keep working together, right? That's sort of the, the key there. And especially when you're talking to an angel investor, because their motivations can vary so wildly, depending on whether they're doing this for fun or doing this for financial reward or for both, uh, you should definitely spend some time learning about them and why they do this, right? So, you know, I always find it interesting when founders prefer to first start pitching rather than first hearing what we invest in. Um, because that's, to me, that's the opposite of what you want to do in what is effectively a, a first sales meeting, right? Like you want to learn about why this person is here and why they're listening to you. So I would leave with that, right? You sit down with them, ask them, you know, how's day going, whatever, like, tell me more about you. How did you get into this, et cetera. And then you kind of know what direction to take it in. Um, and how to position it so that if there is a potential fit, it becomes clear why there's a fit. 
Um, and then again, you're just, you know, you're trying to establish status of the company, uh, sort of the basics where the person in front of you can sort of figure out whether this is, whether this is something that qualifies for an opportunity for them, um, if it's even a space or a stage they invest in, and then enough information to get them excited about learning more. So that's sort of the, the first meeting. Do you want to go into the sort of the later stages, the diligence process? I, I just want to reiterate something that you said, which was, um, and I think this is if you guys are taking notes and tweeting things out there, um, that going into a meeting, the first thing you should do is ask questions and listen instead of start talking and pitching yourself. Um, so I, in addition to the dating metaphor, I also think of it as just, um, you know, you're, you're a salesperson. And yeah. like, what can you do to be a top salesperson? Well, like the top salespeople are genuinely interested in their prospects. Um, they don't start off like pitching their product or pitching whatever the thing they're trying to sell. They start off by active listening, seeing what keeps them up at night, you know, seeing what sorts of challenges they're having, what gets them excited. And um, yeah, it's, it's this fundamental psychology that people love talking about themselves. And the investor is also human and also loves talking about him or herself. And so understanding those kind of basic human interactions and desires, it's kind of like you're doing, you're, you're selling them by listening and having them sell themselves to you first. Yep. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so that, that's, that's just kind of what I wanted to get into. And then, yeah. So, so let's say you've had this first date. Um, what's next? Yeah. So in most cases, either you or the person you just met with will send a follow-up email saying, hey, it was great to meet you. Uh, would love to continue the conversation. Maybe there's sort of a follow-up item that naturally came up in the conversation for someone to send over. And that will sort of kick it off, right? Usually if you don't get you know, a decision in that meeting as to, to like a go or no-go on the process, you'll usually establish that within the next email exchange or so. I would personally recommend that you always follow up with everyone. Um, it typically just makes it seem like you're on top of your process and it's a sign as to how you run your business. Uh, with that said, there are definitely times where just logistics work out that we get back to a computer faster and we as investors reach out first, either way. But if you don't hear back, you should definitely reach out within a day or two um, to follow up and see what's going on. So typically, now again, the, the diligence process will vary a lot from angels to VCs. Um, some angels go through sort of a full diligence process as well. Others will wait for a lead, right? So we hear this a lot from founders. Yeah, I have three angels who said they are willing to invest, but they want a, you know, a, someone to lead the round and price it and set terms and all that. Sometimes you have that as well. If you end up going into a diligence process, whether with an angel or a VC firm, typically it'll have multiple stages. Um, the core of it will probably be around your business fundamentals. So everything from historical to projected financials market sizing, industry trends, essentially all of the sort of qualitative business things about it. Um, one thing that can seem really disorienting to founders is this focus on numbers and metrics and financials at the very early stages. I think what's important to remember there is that you'll very rarely have anyone really holding your feet to the fire on the actual numbers themselves. The point of the exercise is really to have a mutual understanding of the levers of the business and how you're thinking about it. So kind of like what we talked about earlier, which is, you know, your growth percentage is an output, right? So what are the inputs? What can we change in order to make this business grow faster or slower or cut burn if we need to? So it's really more about understanding the mechanics of the business to some degree of detail. Typically, um, you know, the diligence process, again, it varies. What we tend to do once we've sort of gotten our heads around the core business proposition and are getting excited about it, we tend to reach out to a number of prospective customers on behalf of the company. So we reach out to people in our own network saying, hey, we recently met with this company. We think this might be interesting to your business. Do you mind you know, jumping on a quick call with them to learn more? Uh, first of all, we think it's helpful to you. And also we would really appreciate the feedback. So we'll do that as a way to not only get some real market feedback, but to also generate some sales leads for the, for the company that they're free to roll with regardless of what happens in our investment process. Um, so we, we tend to do that and it, that's part of our whole process of essentially just getting smarter about the business and really understanding the landscape. Um, we'll go into technical due diligence at a certain point in time, just make sure everything is secure, scalable, architected in a way that makes sense. 
Um, and then toward the end, we tend to do customer reference calls, background checks, legal diligence, and all that. So I'd say that diligence process takes a couple of weeks, assuming the founders have all their materials prepared um, and can respond reasonably quickly. Um, so it'll be probably a couple of weeks, sometimes a couple of months to, to get to a term sheet. And how do you balance, you know, at, at a certain stage, let's say the, because we, we always hear about how investors say you need to pitch more ambitiously, right? Especially mm -hmm. for female founders. And what that often, there's always, always this um, balance of like, when, when is it exaggerating too far? Like what is too ambitious versus mm -hmm. being realistic, which then is perceived as not ambitious enough. Um, so how do you talk about, um, let's say the things that you want to achieve or the customers that are in your pipeline without seeming, you know, with, without going above and beyond and especially getting within the diligence process? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this happens a lot. So I think the first part of it is really just like being super honest internally with yourself and your team and your co-founder on what you actually reasonably expect the growth trajectory of this business to be. What we see a lot of are businesses where like the founders need capital, right? That's the starting point, right? Every business needs capital. So the founders need capital and they're like, where do I get capital? Well, I can't get a loan. So I, I must raise venture capital. And then they try putting their business into the venture capital boxes. Very often that's where you run into this problem where you have reasonable expectations about the business, but the VC wants what seems unreasonable <laughs> because it's not actually a fit. So first of all, I would like spend a lot of time thinking about whether venture capital is the right fit for your business. And VC tends to be the right fit for your business if you have a business that is scalable in and of itself, that is high margin, and that is expected to grow extremely quickly. That's expected to grow at least 3x year over year reasonably, where the inputs of your business result in 3x year over year growth. Like those are sort of the, the core check boxes. If your business will not do that, it's not a bad thing. It just might not be a fit for VC. So I think that's, you know, that's, that's the first step is like figuring out, is this even the right path for my business? And then after that, the way I would think about articulating that growth trajectory tends to be twofold. So what we typically, or at least I don't know, something that resonates with me personally is seeing almost like a stage one and a stage two, which is here's the product we have. Um, here's what we're projecting with our pipeline. And so here's sort of the short term growth plan. And that has to be exciting in and of itself. And then you usually have the stage two, which is, and then when all the stars align, it'll be this big, right? So that's sort of the like short-term plan and then the big vision plan. So I like seeing it laid out that way because then it enables me to understand what's sort of the more realistic um, scenario where you can get more comfortable around it while still understanding what the true upside potential is. Another way that we like seeing this presented is when you actually do sort of the financial modeling, you have, um, three different scenarios. So you have your conservative case, which is basically the, I would bet my left arm that this will happen based on what has happened in the past and our pipeline and everything we know about the business. Then you have the expected, right? Here's what we think we're gonna be able to do when we raise the money and hire these people. And then you have again, the aggressive, which is if everything goes really well, it'll be this. And that again, sort of lets us see the potential without feeling like this is totally pie in the sky, unreasonable. Great. Uh, we had a question from Sosi. She just said, when you said 3X, is it 3X year over year? Yes, or, okay. yes. yes, year over year. Great. Um, and this is, this is kind of a question that springs off of the, you know, we always hear venture capital isn't necessarily the best route. And I think that for some reason that message just doesn't get through. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> Because there, there is a, there aren't that many clear options. Yeah. And so one of the options, you know, as we're talking about different types of investments that has come to my attention more recently is revenue based investing. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't know if you know much about that, but um, is that something that you can talk about? Yeah. Yeah. We've seen a couple of sort of different hybrid models emerge. Um, when you say revenue based, is that sort of, like immediate with an immediate payback as revenue comes in or after a certain time horizon? 
Yeah, so from the way that I understand it, it is that you get an investment, but you're, the, the fund isn't taking any equity. They're not mm-hmm. taking board seats, but essentially what they commit to getting is a percentage of your revenue, like at the end of like some sort of milestone. So it's not, yeah. it's, there's like on the, on the one yeah. end, there's the traditional bank loan, which is like, you know, you got to mm-hmm. pay back at a certain time frame with interest. And then with the revenue based investing, it kind of goes in the middle where you're, you're getting the investment, but it's a much more flexible timeline based off of your revenue growth. Um, yep. But there is interest paid back. And then, and then there's angel fees. Mm-hmm. There. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Yeah. I think that's a really interesting model. Um, one thing I would caution founders to be careful with um, is sort of the, the timing of that, which is why I asked that clarifying question. Cause I think what you explained makes a lot of sense for a lot of businesses. Um, but I would just be careful about like what exactly the terms are of that kicking in. Cause what you don't want is for your growth to be impeded by this repayment that now happens. Right. So imagine it's been, you know, 24 months and you're finally hitting your stride. And now it turns out that, oh man, I can't actually keep reinvesting in the business because I'm now stunted by this repayment schedule. So I would be careful about how that is um, structured. But I think What's interesting about those models, if they're done right, is that it enables you to sort of um, control your own growth trajectory and your destiny a little bit more. Um, And it also just gives more flexibility. The other thing that we didn't talk about, which I think is worth highlighting when it comes to funds, and this is true for whether they're traditional venture funds that take equity or funds that do alternative structures, do as there are, um, funds typically under the traditional models don't get paid or don't make money until there's a liquidity event, right? So that's something to keep in mind that if founders build a wildly profitable business that they just want to like run forever, the funds and the VCs still don't get their money back, right? Which is a problem, which is why you hear about, you know, the forced acquisition route and and all that pressure. So I would just be careful about how it's structured because you can have a repayment schedule. um, But if someone's managing a, you know, a fund and there's still an equity component, it's still going to come up as a challenge. So I think this is a better model actually for individuals. I think, um, you know, I'm hoping that we start seeing more of these alternative financing structures done at the angel level where, you know, they believe in the fundamentals of the business. They're happy with sort of a longer term uh, time horizon with a slower growth trajectory, whatever it might be. Um, I, I think that could be could be really interesting. There's also a handful of other um, funds and, and entities like Indie VC. I don't know if that's familiar to anyone that are also doing these similar um, structures where it's not 100% equity based. Um, there's also, you know, sort of like small business lenders like Bluevine that are doing Um, essentially factoring for invoices if you're a a business where you have accounts receivable for services but you don't have the cash flow immediately there are options there as well um so definitely i think there's like a whole bunch of different options but no one's really been able to i think like aggregate all that information in a great way that's easy to understand for founders yeah and the things that do get media attention are these huge rounds exactly exactly yeah um so yeah, even, even what you just said, I also want to highlight this is that the liquidity event, which is if you're asking for venture capital, you have to go in with the expectation that you are going to sell it. Like this can't be the company that you're going to put your life into forever and grow and grow and grow. Um, And I think that, you know, that sometimes people go in without realizing that that's going to happen or or really coming to terms Mm -hmm. with that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it happens that plans change and founders decide to buy back investors and all that. But it's, it's tricky because the whole relationship is premised on a track, right? And that's why the growth trajectory is something that VCs care about so much. It's because they're thinking about the exit. Um, And when they're thinking about the exit, they know that the exit price is premised on the scale of the company, the revenue, the customer base, and also what the historical growth trajectory has been, right? Because someone's only going to pay you a high multiple in revenue if they have the expectation that the business is going to keep growing quickly. So these things are all related. And I think like the, the logic behind it gets lost sometimes, <laughs> but it's, it's all the institutional structure, structure behind it. So, you know, if you ever are, are, you know, if you're starting a company, you have to either keep in mind if you're raising venture money that you're either going to go public um, or you're going to sell it at some point, but the investors, you know, you have to be aligned with providing that liquidity to your investors. Yeah, definitely. 
Um, and so Ruthie, I see that question in the chat. Definitely, yeah, you have to expect to either sell it or IPO. Um, and one of the questions that we haven't yet talked about is actually the the deal terms. So let's say let's finish off the actual investment meeting um, prior to getting investment. You know the due diligence. What are the terms that someone a founder should consider? Like on um, one, should they do a convertible note or should they do um, you know an, an equity financing? How do they decide upon that? And then secondly, what terms are negotiable? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this can vary a lot depending on where you are in the world. So my perspective tends to skew much more East Coast based, but typically what we see in terms of terms are for companies that are raising friends, family, angel money, pre-seed money, whatever you want to call it, but essentially less than say $2 million of capital. The terms are usually below $5 million valuation. So again, it sort of depends on whether they bootstrapped it, if there's a product built, but you're not going to get more than like a $5 million valuation typically. Once you start raising an institutional seed round or a seed extension or a small series A or whatever, then the range opens up a little bit. But let's say you're looking at five to 10, maybe five to 15 more broadly. And then your series A and B rounds typically are valuations above 15 million, right? So the range there I would say is typically 20 to 40, but of course you also have these outlier rounds that are done you know, a $50 million Series A. Let's say those are outliers. You're typically doing, you know, a five to $15 million round at 20 to 40 pre. Um, so that's sort of where I would put those goalposts. In terms of, you know, the financial structure, a couple of things to keep in mind there. I mean, convertible notes and safe notes and all of these structures have gotten much more popular lately because they tend to be pretty quick to execute um, and they tend to be relatively affordable from a legal perspective. Um, so at the very early stages of the friends, family and angel round, I would say they're probably the most popular mechanism. The reason being that most people don't really wanna price around at that stage because they don't know how to do it, right? That's sort of the, the official story. Um, my advice would be if you can do a priced round anyway and keep your capital structure clean, but no one will really fault you if you do it with safes or convertible notes. Um, with that said, if you do go down the safe or convertible note route, my advice would be to keep all of the terms as sort of standardized as possible. So when we talk about terms for a convertible note, you typically have a discount rate, a valuation cap, um, you know, an interest rate, and an expiration date. So what you don't want to do is have 10 different notes with 10 different sets of terms because it makes it very difficult for you to track, um, you know, what everyone's ownership stake is. So it can get pretty hairy. And then your next round investors are going to look at this financing history and be like, Oh brother, this is a headache. Do I even want to get involved with this? Um, so just keep that in mind. You kind of want to keep things buttoned up to the degree that is possible. Um, and then, you know, at our firm, we only do priced equity rounds for our main investment structures. We'll do convertible notes internally as sort of like quick insider bridges as they're waiting to close a new investor. Um, but typically we use them as a core financing structure again, because we want to just make sure that that cap table is clean and that everyone's clear on, um, you know, what it, what everyone owns. What's negotiable was your other question. Um, a couple, a couple follow-ups from yeah. um, the participants, which is um, one: Could you repeat the components of the convertible note, mm -hmm. discount rate, cap, and? Yes. So typically, a way a convertible note is structured is it's essentially a loan that is expected to convert into equity at a certain point in time. So let's say you raise one million dollars with a cap, a valuation cap of $5 million and a 20% discount. What that means, and there's usually a trigger point, right, written into the terms of the note, that this money will convert into equity when you have a qualifying event. And this qualifying event is usually when you raise a new round of financing above a certain amount of money. So if you then raise a $3 million round, this note converts into equity at the terms of a $5 million cap and a 20% discount. So let's say your next round is done at a valuation of $20 million, just to make this like easy and clear. What that means is that the investors who did the convertible note 
will get whatever terms are more preferable to, de to them. They either convert at a valuation of the cap, which is $5 million, or they convert at a 20% discount to the new price of the new round. So they either convert at 5 million or they convert at 20% of 20 million. So you can all do the math. They get better terms if it's a lower price for them. So they would convert at the valuation cap of 5 million. If your next round is done at a valuation that's lower than the valuation cap, so let's say your next round is done at a valuation of $3 million, they get the better of the cap or the discount. Well, if you take a 20% discount on 3 million, that's better terms for them. So they would convert at that price. Which to clarify, if you do have a down round, which is what it's called, and it goes from five yeah. to three, that's actually bad indicator in terms of the year. Yeah. Business. Yes. It means that things have not gone according to plan. Um, and it is extremely, extremely dilutive to founders to do that. So what you should be thinking about when you're sort of setting these terms is, um, I mean, it will always, always be better for you if your next round is done above your valuation cap, right? Because then your discount rate won't kick in. But you also don't want it to be too low, right? Like you don't want your cap to be like $2 million if you expect your next round to be done at 10. Because that means that those investors are just going to have a significant, significant portion, portion of that. Um, so those are, those are the things to sort of keep in mind there. And then there are other sort of like more nitty gritty ones. Usually there's an interest rate, right? So if they invest $100,000, um, two years later, they're not going to convert the equivalent of 100000 into your round. They're going to convert like $108,000 or $116,000 because they accrue interest on that because it's technically a loan. Um, other things that are kind of interesting about notes, like you can change the way the conversions are structured. So some notes can have sort of like a forced conversion, which basically means if you don't have a qualifying event, in other words, if you don't hit that threshold of $3 million or whatever, and the note reaches its expiration date, which is usually two or three years, you can have, you can sort of like preset the terms of under what circumstances it would convert then. Because the alternative is it's technically a loan that you would have to repay. And chances are, if you haven't been able to raise more money, um, in most situations, you, you are not in a great position to like repay that debt. So you can put in terms that say, yep, it'll convert at these terms if we raise more money. However, if the note expires and we haven't raised more money, it'll convert in these terms. But those are all sort of like nitty gritty things. It's best to kind of get, you know, a lawyer's input on that sort of thing. Yeah. But yeah I would just say, keep it simple. There's a lot of documentation out there that like already has templated docs and most of it is fine to, to use. Yeah, and to the question, Kirti, around the safe. So the safe is essentially a convertible note, but without an expiration date and without interest, you know, depending on yeah. the, the principle. So, so, it's, so it's really founder friendly. A, it's basically a handshake. Like it doesn't sit on your balance sheet. It's not technically debt, right? Like in the case of a liquidity event, let's say the company goes bankrupt, usually you pay out debt, or debt holders first. Um, like that, like the safes aren't really anywhere. It's basically just a promise. It's called a simple agreement for future equity. It's like, there's really no terms to this. I just promise that one day when this happens, I will give you equity. Um, it's, it's a bizarre instrument, candidly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and also, I think it's a good question from Nicola who asked about um, the ESOP or the employee stock option pool. Um, she says, is this still expected that it's in place prior to the investment thus decreasing the founder equity? Or is there a convincing argument to put to investors as to why it should not be required at this stage and should be done after the investment? Yeah, so yeah, so this is effectively a valuation question, right? So your option pool, for those of you who aren't familiar, you carve out a certain percent of the total company's shares to allocate to future hires, right? That's the reason you do this. Typically, let's say it's anywhere from five to 10%. Sometimes it's higher. It really depends what the hiring plan is and how much of the team is already set up. But let's say it's 10% to make things easy. If you carve it out before the investment is done, that means that everyone who's currently on the cap table, which is gonna be mostly just the founders, right? At the super early stages, everyone gets diluted by 10%. Um, if you do it after the investment, that means that everyone, including the current investors, right, these people who just put money in, they get diluted by 10%. And so the, you know, the dilution to the founders is less. Um, realistically, it, if you increase the valuation, 
and then do the option pool afterwards, you get the same outcome in terms of what the founder owns or vice versa, right? So like you can argue about this, whether you do it before or after, but the reality is what you're really arguing about is like, what is everyone's ownership state going to be once you have the funding and you have an option pool? So I don't know. It's really just like a mechanical question. I don't know that you kind of want to die on this hill because I think you should kind of just reach agreement as to like how much money you want to owe or like how much equity you're comfortable owning after you've done the round and after you have your option pool. Yep. Yeah. Um, and there was also another comment that I think I wanted to highlight about you, uh, what you said about convertible notes and just generally different investors and giving the same terms to everyone. Um, mm -hmm. so, it's, so it's kind of like doing your work beforehand to figure out, okay, what valuation do you think is reasonable? Maybe you're having some conversations with initial investors and seeing where the range is sitting. And then once you decide on it, you decide on your um, discount and whatever other terms that you might, whatever you decide should be the same thing that you give to everyone. Yeah, exactly. And sometimes we'll see like these rolling closes, which basically means you keep the same terms open forever for like six to nine months. Um, if you can try not to do that for a couple of reasons. One reason is it's a massive distraction for the founders to always be fundraising. So ideally you can kind of time box it to be like, great for two to four months or three to six months, I'm fundraising. Then I'm going to go back to operating for the most part. That's great. The second reason is it actually makes your operating plan difficult to execute on because, you know, how do you know who to hire and how many people to hire if you don't really know how much money you have to play with? Um, so the more you can actually like close it in tranches and say, great, I know I have 400K in the bank. I know I can do these things better. And the last reason is, you know, ideally over that period of time, your business is growing and the value is increasing. And hopefully six to 12 months later, you know, new investors would come in at, less punitive and less dilutive terms than the earlier ones. Um, so you don't want to have the same instrument open for too long because as the business is growing, you don't want to keep giving up, you know, a significant portion of equity um, at the same terms that you gave it to, to sort of like the previous investors who appropriately so got better terms because they took on more risk earlier in the life cycle. So ideally, you know, if you do end up raising multiple notes, try to time box them, right? From, for this raise, we're issuing 300K, it's at these terms. And then if you end up raising more money later on, if it's not a priced round, it's sort of a new tranche, um, you know, new series of notes. Mm -hmm. And so that, that really reiterates the, the desire for a lot of founders or the need to create FOMO, um, right? Yeah. If, you have a, if you have a time box and you're saying, okay, it's closing, it's closing, um, like you're kind of forcing the investor to give you a clear yes or a no. Yep. Yep. The one caveat I would add there is you definitely need to have a full enough pipeline for that to actually happen because the worst is when founders create a false sense of FOMO and then like the round doesn't close because they couldn't raise the money, right? Like you know, that's a situation you don't want to be in. So you definitely have to treat it like a sales process where you're constantly thinking about like adding more to the funnel, adding more potential investors um, because you need to still actually legitimately have that momentum in order to close at the date that you're setting. Mm, yeah. Um, there is a question from Susanna about she, just hearing that a lot of times or now the investment landscape has changed and that angels are looking for the same sorts of traction as VCs. Um, are you seeing that as well? Yeah, it depends on the angels. Um, I, I would say generally that is a trend we're seeing with a lot of the established angel groups. Um, for individual angels, less so, but God, it just, it varies so much from person to person. I think yeah. you have to just establish that as soon as you can in your meeting, like what are your expectations? And if that person wants series A traction, you got to just be able to like move on sooner rather than later. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the, the, the point that I also want to stress is that I think, you know, just getting oftentimes a lot of questions about, so what exactly is the range that angels are looking for? What exactly are the terms angels are looking for? Like the, like yeah. there is no way to answer that. It's it's like even if we bring it back to this metaphor of dating, it's kind of like saying, well, what do men look for? What do women look for? You know, it's right. like it depends on the person and it depends on the, you know, type of industry or the type of, you know, traits that they're looking for in, in a particular person they want to invest in. And so um, I think 
this this just goes back to the human aspect of it is this is about developing relationships and a lot of times when it comes to angel investors it's really about people who do end up investing in their friends or the people that they've learned to trust and have seen operate and succeed over time. Absolutely. And at the very early stages, I mean, all of these terms, you can kind of put general market uh, bands around what's normal for pre-seed, seed, et cetera, but it, it truly is driven pretty much entirely by demand. So if you only have one buyer and they say your valuation is $2 million and they'll write you a check at that valuation, that's it, right? If you have multiple investors who, you know, are super excited and you're oversubscribed and someone's willing to pay a higher price and they say, listen, I'll write you the check at 5 million, then it's 5 million, right? Like it's just, it's whatever the market will give you. It's very sort of like pure capitalism in that sense. What you want to keep in mind there, right? The implications to, again, twofold. One is you want to make sure you have sort of enough people around the table and that you're, you know, you're talking to enough investors to, to get enough interest. Um, it's kind of like when you go out for, you know, a new job and you want to get multiple job offers. So you have some leverage and negotiating power, same thing with the caveat that you don't want to get too far ahead of your plan and, you know, get ahead of your skis and that you want to make sure that your, you know, your valuation is putting you in a reasonable place, given what you expect the traction and the growth trajectory to be, to make sure that your next round doesn't end up being a down round, right? Cause you, you know, you're putting yourself on thin ice there. So drive demand, but at the same time, make sure it's reasonable for the operations of your business. Awesome. Um, so, you know, we're nearing the end of these office hours. So if anyone has any last questions, feel free to type it into the chat box. And if um, for, for those of you, just one alternative type of funding that I also want to highlight, um, especially given she works with recent acquisition with Republic is crowdfunding. Um, and equity crowdfunding and um, equity crowdfunding is, you know, the it's kind of like Kickstarter, except anyone can invest, you know, non-accredited investors, your, your best friend, your neighbor, your mom could invest as little as $10 into your company. And it really becomes a way to get access to capital democratically. Um, and and it's, it's kind of a, a marketing campaign. And so um, for those of you who might be interested in it and uh, want to look more into the potential and this is especially great for companies that um, have a number of uh, a big user base or they have a big community network that they think would support them and tap into um, investing in their company. We currently have a, the SheWorks Equity Crowdfunding Challenge that's happening right now where um, you can apply and we are um, supporting three female entrepreneurs and covering all of their costs when it comes to helping them set up that campaign, going through the legal due diligence, um, and making sure that their company is ready uh, for, for that investment. Um, and so, yeah, that's the, the last plug. And then just two, one more question. If you do crowdfunding, how much do you have to give in exchange? Um, so that is something that, again, same, same thing, just like when you're raising a regular investment round, it depends on your um, valuation or cap. It depends on how much you're raising. It, it, there's there's a lot of dependencies and it ultimately comes down to your business and where you are and what the kind of market benchmarks are for, uh, for your company. Um, and then let's see, last question. Jess says, if this has been asked, but what metrics are used to determine valuation at a pre-seed level? Demand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's what I was talking about earlier. It really is like whatever you can get the market to give you. And, you know, it, it's very qualitative, right? There's no hard metrics, but the pre-seed level, you usually don't even have a product launched yet, right? And so it's, you know, depending on who the founder is, if it's a repeat founder, you can expect that you'll get a higher valuation because they're sort of more, you know, the investors view that as a de-risked investment to a larger degree because they know that the operator is solid. Um, but realistically, you know, it, it's all just based on whatever the market's willing, willing to give. Not a lot of metrics there. Awesome. Cool. Um, so this was a really, really great conversation. I think, Jerry, you were able to break down a lot of these more complicated, nuanced parts of fundraising down in a really clear way. So thank you for that. Um, you. And um, for those of you who want to get in touch with Jerry, um, is there a best way, whether on social or email or LinkedIn? Yeah, email is best. LinkedIn is very hard for me <laughs> to keep track of. <laughs> but email is great. Twitter is good, too. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then last thing is for those of you who tuned in, um, in a couple of weeks on August 22nd, 
I'll be back doing office hours with Howie Diamond, who's a partner at Alphabridge Ventures. Oh, cool. And um, in September, we will be having our She Works Breakfast in New York City. And thirdly, if you are interested in crowdfunding, go to sheworks.com slash republic. And the challenge is going through August 15th. So you have a few more days to apply and it's a pretty short application to, to share your company. Awesome. awesome. One, can I add one last thing? Um, on our website, actually, we have a lot of this sort of um, due diligence material documented. So if you go to our blog section, it's, uh, it's called On the Record on our website. You can actually see like our due diligence checklist and just a lot about how we operate. So if that's helpful for anyone to read through, feel free to check that out. We also have um, open office hours at our offices every Tuesday from 1 to 3. So you can just grab a time slot on our calendar open to everyone who just has questions. Um, and we also have our, our um, investment application form public on our website too. So you can, you know, if, if your company is a fit for our investment parameters, feel free to just submit directly online. You don't need to get a warm entry or anything. We review all of that. Awesome. Thank awesome. you so much. Cool. Well, thank you both. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Lisa, so much for sharing all these insights. It's super helpful. And thank you everyone for joining us and putting in these wonderful questions in the chat and Q&A. Um, if your question didn't get answered, um, please head on over to the Woman Made community on HelloLS.com and uh, we'll be helping answer those questions there. And then we'll also be sharing the recording of this session as well as those amazing resources Jerry just mentioned there. So we'll, you'll have links to all of that as well. Um, and yeah, just thank you everyone so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thanks. Bye everyone. Thanks. Bye.